Um, Heather, can you make sure you're letting people in? Because I'm going to get out of this now. Hey, welcome everybody to our October um, ADPC meeting. I'm going to call the roll. Jill Archer. Present. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brad Anderson. Here. Welcome. Commissioner Cruz. Commissioner Cruz. Commissioner Maziotti. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Holton. Commissioner Holton. Commissioner Hubie. Present. Commissioner uh, Minty Morris. Commissioner Godvin. Here. Commissioner, welcome. Commissioner Neeson. <clears throat> Vice Chair Galleran. Present. Commissioner Clarkson. Commissioner Garrett. Here. Thank you. Chair Vesna. Here. Representative Solman. Nicole. Yes, Nicole is here. Thanks, Nicole. Judge Block. Present. Director Steve Allen. Member Emeritus, Dr. Anthony Biglin. Dr. Biglin. All right, Chair, we have quorum by the um, by a small margin, but we do have quorum. Hello, uh, Dr. Richardson. This is Laura Nissen. I'm here. Sorry, was I think maybe came in after a roll had started. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate you. Yeah, and then it looks like we also have um, Nicole Corbin here. Uh, I assume in place of Steve Allen, correct? I am happy to be your substitute, Steve Allen, for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take we'll take we'll take what we can get. And you're you're a great replacement. Oh, okay. <laughs> And it looks like Commissioner Cruz just came on. Oh, we got we got a full party now. We're getting there. Did Dwight is Dwight in here too? Did Dwight hop in? Okay. Um, do we have our our presenters here for our first agenda item? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to try not to butcher the names, but it looks like we're going to be talking about substance use related fatalities the most recent report that oha has we have vicky bulo and yunshen xingshen yeah close. <laughs> okay uh well if you guys are prepared and ready to go just let us know what you need um i don't know if we've given you the opportunity to share your own slides or if you sent that over to us but we can figure that out here right now i have um the slides Vicki, if you want me to run the slides, I can or you can. Oh, if you could run them, that would be awesome. <clears throat> okay, I will Thank attempt. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Thing. Okay, hopefully you have them, you can see them. I can, I hope everyone else can as well. All right. Okay, thank you commissioners. Thank you everyone for having us here today. 
Uh, my name is Vicki Bulo. I am the lead research analyst in the Alcohol and Other Drug Prevention Program, which, which sits in the Public Health Division, Health Promotion and Chronic Disease Prevention Program. I've been here a few times. I've seen some of your faces, so good to see you all again. Um, I am here with Xing Shen, and we're here to talk to you today about substance use related uh, fatalities in Oregon. And I'll let Xing introduce himself uh, a little later when, you get, when we get to his slides, but I'm gonna kick things off here. So next slide. So our outline for, day, for today is, is pretty simple. Um, I'm going to talk about how we measure alcohol fatalities. And then I'm going to turn it over to Xing to talk about how overdose and poisoning fatalities are measured. Um, we'll then show you where you can find some of this data on the web, and we should have uh, plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I will mention that one thing that we won't be talking specific, one thing that we won't specifically be talking about today um, are tobacco related deaths. But I can totally come back uh, at another time to talk about that if you'd like. Because that's the first thing I want to talk about is our local use and contraband discussion. Um, so yeah, Granite um, is getting bombarded quite a bit. Hey, folks, can you mute yourselves? Can you guys mute yourselves? They're making Pruno in the middle of the day room. Uh, I think that's Pat. OK. OK. <laughs> Sorry, Vicky, go ahead. It's okay, no worries. Yeah, before we just dive in, I just want to mention that we, what we won't be talking about today are tobacco-related fatalities, and I can totally come back to talk about that um, in the future, but just wanted to throw that out there and remind folks that, you know, tobacco is still the leading cause of preventable death in the state, and while rates have uh, gone down in recent years, just want to just call out that tobacco still contributes to more deaths than alcohol, overdose, and poisonings combined. But we're not going to talk about that today. <laughs> so next slide. So just a little bit of context before we dive in. Um, you know, if we're wanting to count fatalities, it all starts with the death certificate. And uh, over 10 years ago, I worked as the state mortality analyst, and I was in that position for about four years before I moved on. So I have two disclaimers here. Uh, one is that I have a morbid fondness for the death certificates. I love vital records, and they're called vital records for a reason, because they are our primary and longest running source of population health information that we have, really. And then the second caveat is that because that was so long ago, my brain might be a little foggy on some of this stuff, but I'm going to try to explain all of this accurately to you. Um, so during my time as the mortality analyst, I learned everything about the death certificate. So I can tell you what they're good for and then also what they're not so good for. And there are definite limitations to the death certificate. One being is that uh, causes of death on the death certificate they're more about disease, illness, and physical trauma than they are necessarily about a decedent's behavior that may have led to those things. And so causes on the death certificate are based on codes which come from the International Classification of Diseases or ICD codes. So, you know, more about disease and illness than behavior on the death certificate. So second is that, you know, the death information we get from the death certificate is only as good as what the certifier puts on it. I was told once that one hour of medical school is devoted to learning how to properly fill out a death certificate. But, you know, knowing personally how death certificates work and how complex they could be, that bit of information absolutely horrified me. But any medical or MD people in the room, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> So anyway, those who certify death certificates don't um, also don't necessarily have a long standing relationship with the person who died or have all the health information about that person on hand and they're going off the information that they currently have access to. So next slide. So while counting fatalities always starts with the death certificate, it doesn't always end there. Again, the death certificate tells you the disease or illness or trauma that caused the death. 
This is known as uh, the underlying cause of death, but you really need more information if you want to get some of that, um, you know, behavioral information. So, for example, let's say somebody dies in a car accident uh, due to somebody else's drunk driving. You know, the this person's cause of death on their death certificate is going to say blunt force trauma due to vehicle collision because that's what ultimately, you know, causes this person's death. You know, the death certificate won't contain information about why that vehicle collision occurred. And so to get that, you need more information. And seeking out more information about fatalities is, is common public health practice. You know, death certificate, death certificate information is often supplemented with additional information. So for example, from medical examiner data, for traffic safety data, for crime and homicide data, or by using specific methodologies that create different estimates on the death certificates themselves. And so sometimes, you know, gathering this additional information can actually change the original cause or manner of death listed on a death certificate. So say, you know, a, a death occurs and the cause of death is unknown. It usually will go to the medical examiner who will then determine, you know, the manner of that death. So that would be a natural death accident, suicide, homicide, uh, and what that cause of death is. So sometimes after that additional information is collected, the death certificate actually changes, but it doesn't always change that way. So a lot of the times when additional information is sought out, you know, that information from the original death certificate and the new death or the new information gets put into an additional data system. And that's where we have other specialized fatality data systems like the fatal accident reporting system, the national violent death reporting system. There are suicide death reporting systems, very specialized additional systems that we can use to get more information and better information about fatalities. One of those other data systems is the state unintentional death and overdose reporting system, which Shane is going to talk about later. So, you know, this is what we want. We want to get that better information. So I just wanted to sort of explain how that happens here. So next slide. All right, alcohol is up first. Next slide. So one of the, one of the first ways that OHA, uh, the, sorry, first I'm gonna talk about alcohol fatalities. And there are two ways in which OHA has measured and reported alcohol fatalities traditionally. The first being alcohol induced deaths. So certain causes of death, you know, by definition are, are caused by alcohol consumption. And so the causes of death listed here are 100% uh, attributable um, to alcohol and they come directly from the death certificate. So no, no additional information is, is used here. And so most of these are chronic conditions that are due to alcohol use over time. Hence, you see the term uh, alcoholism in many of these codes here. So in a sense, you know, we are getting some behavioral information here, but what we wouldn't know here is if the decedent was actually ever diagnosed or clinically diagnosed with alcoholism or an alcohol use disorder, right? That information isn't on the death certificate. But looking at this list here, you see that the bottom two, the two, there are two acute causes of death listed here that are 100% alcohol attributable, and that is um, alcohol poisoning, um, uh, intentional and unintentional. And then you'll see from this list here that there are there's several types of, of injuries and other diseases that we know alcohol contributes to, and we'll and they're not listed here, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So one of the limitations of this alcohol induced measurement method is that it actually does undercount the true public health burden of alcohol fatalities. So next slide. So here's what alcohol induced deaths looked like in uh, 2019. So we see that alcoholic liver disease by far is the largest contributor at 60% of all alcohol induced deaths. Uh, followed by mental and behavioral disorders related to alcohol at about 32% of all deaths. So this category um, include, these are like the F codes, and they include things like harmful use of alcohol, uh, dependence and withdrawal syndrome, 
amnesiac syndrome, amnesic syndrome, and psychotic disorders. So alcoholic liver disease and mental and behavioral disorders related to alcohol are the bulk of alcohol-induced deaths. And then after that, it drops off quite a bit. And we've got a you know, small smattering of some of the other causes of death, like poisoning, pancreatitis, heart disease and cardiomyopathy, and very few intentional self-poisonings. And we had one fetal alcohol syndrome death in 2019. Next slide. So uh, since the year 2000, uh, the alcohol-induced death rate has increased by nearly 70%. Uh, we see a about a 50% increase for men, uh, but for women, we've seen a uh, more than doubling at about a 124% increase since the year 2000. Next slide. And then looking at alcohol-induced deaths by race and ethnicity, we see the disproportionate share of this burden on our American Indian and Alaska Native population. Um, their rate is nearly three times higher. And all I can say is that I hope this graph clearly illustrates where alcohol prevention and treatment uh, need to go. Next slide. And then here we see alcohol in, uh, the alcohol induced death rate uh, by age, uh, with middle to those early older ages um, having the highest rate. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, so second is alcohol-related deaths, and we calculate alcohol-related deaths uh, using a methodology developed by the CDC called the Alcohol-Related Disease Impact, or we call it ARDI. <laughs> and this method was developed to show that larger public health burden of alcohol beyond you know, those causes of death that are 100% attributable to alcohol. And this is what the Public Health Division primarily uh, reports around alcohol-related deaths using this method uh, to sort of demonstrate and make people aware of that larger, you know, public health impact. And so, for example, the research is clear um, that alcohol is used is related to seven different types of cancers, uh, heart disease and stroke, several types of injuries, homicide, suicide, and motor vehicle crashes. And there's enough research out there and enough research has been done to show that, or to know that a certain proportion of these uh, causes of death that are listed here are actually caused by alcohol. But, you know, the death, death certificate can't capture all of it. So, you know, again, you know, these causes of uh, death like hypothermia and aspiration, like, pretty well known that alcohol, you know, plays a role in that, but it's not necessarily something that's um, captured on the death certificate because, you know, the underlying cause is actually hyperthermia or aspiration. Um, so uh, for the causes of death listed here, the RDE methodology estimates the proportion of these deaths that alcohol contributes to. And these proportions are called attributable fractions. And again, these fractions are based on scientific studies that have directly uh, measured the relationship between excessive alcohol use and a given health outcome. Uh, they typically come from large systematic uh, meta-analyses or follow-up studies that include more detailed information from medical record reviews, interviews with next of kin, or some combinations of these that have directly assessed uh, a decedent's pattern of alcohol consumption. And uh, one limitation of this method that the CDC states is that there are even more alcohol attributable causes of death that are excluded from this list just simply because there isn't quite enough suitable evidence to develop that attributable fraction. So causes of death like hepatitis C and HIV are, are even excluded from this list. So CDC still considers this method um, an undercount. Okay, next slide. So uh, using this methodology, we find that in 2019, there were over uh, 2,100 alcohol-related deaths uh, in Oregon. And so if you look at sort of how these are, are, are categorized, you'll see that, you know, 44% of these deaths fall in that category of that 100% attributable cause category. 
And then uh, the remaining 64% were due to those attributable fractions or those other causes of death that alcohol is known to contribute to based on the CDC RD methodology. Um, I showed you a breakdown uh, for alcohol induced deaths that kind of showed those individual causes of death for that category. I can't do that here for the attributable fraction side unless I spend a lot of time doing a lot of digging into the data, but I can tell you that, you know, the, the bulk of that 64% are, you know, heart disease, unspecified liver disease, uh, cancer and injuries make up that the bulk of that 64% of those attributable fraction diseases. Okay, next slide. So, uh, uh, CDC also recently changed the way that they calculate RD. Uh, they did an update of their methodology. And so for this particular slide, we're only going back to 2010 here. But, um, you know, using the older method, uh, you know, we found that alcohol related deaths have increased by over a third since the since the year 1990, I think. But here you just see from 2010 till 2019. Um, and since then, uh, there's been since since 2000, there's been an increase of 13 percent in the last nine years. And over that time, we've seen a 15 percent increase for men and a 9 percent increase for women. Next slide. And then by race and ethnicity, we see the exact same pattern that we see with alcohol induced deaths. So, you know, whatever method you're using here, you see a pretty similar pattern no matter what demographics you're looking at. So they're both indicators that, you know, correlate with each other. Next slide. And then finally, looking at it by um, age, it's a little bit different here. We see that um, age 65 and over group having the highest rate for alcohol induced or sorry, alcohol related deaths um, compared to that 45 to 64 age group had the highest rate for alcohol induced deaths. And this makes sense. Um, given how alcohol contributes to many chronic diseases like cancer and heart disease, which which tend to show up um, in those older ages. So that's all I have on alcohol fatalities. Um, we can save questions for the end or I can uh, answer any questions that come to mind right now before I turn it over to Shane. I have a question if I could ask. This is Don Maziotti. Hi, Don. Yeah, I'm a, hi, how are you doing? Good. I was wondering, given your presentation and that of other parts of the organization, what are the policy implications from the analysis that you've just provided us with? Do you, are you responsible for that, or is there some place where we could find that, uh, the implications from a policy standpoint? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, our section is involved um, in those, you know, population health policies that we really want to get to in order to, you know, reduce excessive alcohol use related harms and fatalities. So um, the CDC has a, um, a uh, the community preventative task force findings, which sort of make recommendations on what those policies are and you know what policies to use in order to reduce um, alcohol excessive alcohol use and related harms and fatalities at the population level and those are things like uh, raising the price of alcohol uh, maintaining private or sorry maintaining state control over distilled spirits if you are a state that has um, this control in some way of alcohol products it's also limiting, it's, it's strategies that limit the availability, um, exposure to advertising, and also um, ensuring uh, liability laws, liquor liability laws, and, and ensuring that enforcement for underage drinking is, is taking place. So those are, those are the policy strategies to reduce excessive alcohol consumption at the population level. A, a related issue to the population strategy or that based on it, do you have I, I didn't think you had or have any data on uh, substance abuse among the homeless population, which is probably 8,000 and important. I am unaware. I am not um, familiar or know who holds information about the homeless population, but if anybody else does, feel free to share. I'm not sure if that is something that OHA collects or not, actually. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Son. Uh, does anybody else have any questions regarding this part of the presentation? Proceed on. Okay. Yeah, well All right, done. Shane, I think I'm turning it over to you now. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Xing San. I'm an epidemiologist work with the injury and the violence prevention program, public health division. And this is my first time attending this kind of meeting. So it's nice to meet all of you. Today, I'm going to talk about the um, drug overdose deaths. Okay, just waiting for the slides. Yeah, hold on one second. Yeah. I'm having trouble. Okay. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, as you know, uh, drug overdose deaths uh, has been increased steadily for past uh, um, two decades. Um, here, uh, I'm talking to, today I'm going to just talk about the unintentional drug overdose deaths because you know, uh, drug overdose deaths could be suicide overdose. Um, also could be undetermined to know the, the, their in, intent is accidental or suicidal. So here um, today I'm focused on the unintentional drug overdose deaths. Next slide, please. Yeah, before I go to um, focus on the data, I'm going to just introduce a new uh, data system. It's called the State Unintentional Drug Overdose uh, Reporting System. In short, pseudos. And this is, system is funded by CDC. Oregon just defined uh, in uh, two years ago. So we started collect the data since July um, 2019. So we don't have much data on that, but just have like one and a half year data so far. This data system is um, it's new. Um, it's collected data from uh, multiple data sources. Besides their death certificate data, also we collect the information from the medical examiner report, include the toxicology test results. Because of that, uh, so this data system, it's kind of like have rich information beside the general information from death certificate, also have uh, detailed uh, information surrounding the incident, like uh, what kind of drug uh, involved and uh, um, the person uh, died from overdose, and uh, their mental health, behavioral health in the past. Uh, also, um, some information related to uh, incident. And uh, so here, because different data system has different definition or case uh, uh, collection. So here, uh, if you look at the report, sometimes you might be say, uh, like news reports say, this is data from medical examiner, and this is say, so from vital record. So, if you look at the different data source, you might find that the number is not exactly the same. But I would say, in general, say uh, all the data source provide the comparable information related to uh, drug overdose deaths. But you have to just pay attention different uh, um, data source. Sometimes the number is not identical. But in general, say there, if you look at the um, trend, use same data information, same data source, the general shows same trends. So today I'm just going to uh, focus on the, the new data system, Sudos, give you uh, information uh, about the drug overdose recently, specifically focused on the last year, 2020, because uh, you already heard a lot of uh, news reports say uh, the drug overdose death jump um, in 2020. Next slide, please. Yeah, first let's look at the, um, the people who die drug overdose, uh, what they are. In general, say most uh, people die from drug overdose in Oregon last year, 2020, are uh, mid-age men and women. Average age is 42 to 43 years old, they're young. 
Second, uh, this graph on the right just show you uh, rates, overdose death rates uh, by uh, sex. You can say also by age. You can say uh, the peak uh, drug overdose happening among the age for men is 25 to uh, 54. For women is 35 to 54. So a little bit different for their, uh, the peak age drug overdose deaths. Also overall, you can say it's uh, um, the main, the light blue bar. For every age group, men is more likely to die by drug overdose than women. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, but if you, you look at it by uh, race and ethnicity, then uh, non-Hispanic uh, American Indian um, population has the highest uh, overdose death rate in Oregon, followed by uh, non-Hispanic uh, black population. Then non-Hispanic uh, non uh, Asian Pacific Island, uh, this population has lowest uh, overdose death rate, uh, followed by Hispanic uh, um, population. Then if you look at compared to male to female, then male is 2.4 uh, times more likely to die a drug overdose than uh, female. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, also uh, I want to say kind of like this. Um, another uh, information from this data system uh, collect information about the homeless. So from our data system show, uh, last year, 2020, about 14% uh, drug overdose deaths are among the homeless people. This table just show you uh, mental health and uh, behavioral health uh, among the, this, uh, this pupil who die by drug overdose deaths. So here, just give you a summary. From here, you can see over 97% drug overdose deaths uh, due to the um, drug abuse. Next is kind of like you can say uh, about the one third people had a diagnosis of mental illness and about 20% had alcohol use problem. Then about nearly 98% of them uh, had a non-alcohol related to substance abuse uh, problem. Sadly, you can say so, uh, here, nearly 90% do not have um, treatment for their drug abuse problem. Just uh, about 2.7% of them, when they die at that time is under treatment. This is huge, huge gap. We should pay attention on that. Also, even among the deaths due to opioid deaths, only about 12% uh, one instant happened, they had a chance to get naloxone treatment. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, among these uh, deaths in 2020, um, unintentional deaths total up around like a 60, uh, 665. If you, we look at the drug involved, then about a half, and um, their deaths, drug overdose deaths are due to a single drug overdose. Then about the 29% uh, involved with two drugs. Then about 20% uh, involved with three or more drugs. If we look at the uh, drug, just the list of frequency, you can see uh, nearly like a 90, uh, 49% um, um, overdose deaths are um, massive fentanyl. Then about a third, one third is involved with uh, uh, fentanyl. About 28% uh, um, involved with heroin. About 10% um, related to alcohol. Then about 9% uh, uh, involved with uh, cocaine. Um, if we just focus on the three common drugs, massive fentanyl, fentanyl and the heroin. Next slide, please. Yeah, then here you can see it's kind of like, a, uh, this table is small too hard to read. I just want to show you 
how complicated this drug involved does. Then in summary, methamphetamine, heroin, and fentanyl used alone or in combination with other drugs uh, in last year, 2020, um, climb a total 585 deaths in Oregon. This is, if you, we look at the, for the total deaths, this count about the 88% of total um, drug overdose deaths. So this is, uh, in other words, is uh, in Oregon last year, the drug overdose deaths are mainly due to illicit drug use or abuse. And if you look at the, the pharmaceutical output, the count just the, um, if we look at, the, say, just the, look at the pharmaceutical output, only a count, use alone, just count less than 3% deaths. So even you look at some like a pharmaceutical output of drug involved deaths, but also involved with uh, just I mentioned like mass fentanyl, heroin and fentanyl. So this is, I think this is three drugs, uh, mass, mass, uh, mass and fentanyl, heroin and fentanyl is kind of like a really, really problem for Oregon. Next slide, please. Yeah, if we buy drug type, then um, opioid uh, um, contribute, or you can say it's all related to uh, the drug overdose count about like 40%. Stimulants like methamphetamine, cocaine, um, amphetamine, then count for about like the 28%. Both uh, output and the stimulants count another combined, this both drug combined, count about the 30% of deaths. So overall, opioid related deaths counted for 68% of five total overdrug dose deaths. Then uh, for the stimulants, count for 57.5% uh, drug overdose deaths in Oregon. Together, nearly 97% unintentional drug overdose deaths in Oregon are caused by opioid or and uh, stimulants. Next slide, please. Please. No. Yeah, this is just a look at the trend uh, by drug. Then, um, the top line, the orange one is total drug overdose deaths. The, the yellow line is for methamphetamine. Then blue line, so, solid blue line is for the fentanyl. So here you can see mainly driver force for uh, last year, the drug overdose jump. Then um, uh, driver force, uh, methamphetamine and the fentanyl. Specific, specifically for fentanyl, you can see um, compared to uh, 2019, there are not many fentanyl overdose deaths, but the last year it's kind of like just uh, uh, increase, increase, very sharp increase. Um, so total last year, uh, fentanyl related uh, overdose deaths is about 230 uh, deaths. That's a lot. Yeah, also uh, right now we don't have uh, like a final number for 2021, but the, based on the data we have right now is, is very preliminary, doesn't look good. It's kind of like a drug overdose deaths uh, continue to increase and the fentanyl still, the, the, the deaths related to fentanyl overdose is also increased too. Next, uh, next please. Yeah, finally, uh, just uh, want to show you uh, to, to say like uh, where the um, drug overdose deaths happen. By number, 74% uh, uh, drug overdose deaths uh, happen or take place, uh, take place at six big populated county, Multnomah, Lane, Marine, Clackamas, Washington, and Jackson. But by rate, uh, two county, uh, Motonoma and the uh, Lane County had the highest uh, drug overdose death rate. And then uh, Washington County, Benton, uh, Deschutes, and the Coos, this four county has uh, a, a, a little bit lower uh, death rate uh, compared to state average. Then the rest of the county um, is kind of like a 
besides the four county uh, at the top, you can say small county do not have drug overdose deaths in last year. So this is kind of like general uh, picture about the drug overdose deaths. And at the beginning, I just mentioned it's kind of like a, you already heard uh, say the drug overdose deaths jump. Um, in 2019 in Oregon, um, the drug overdose deaths, unintentional drug overdose deaths, about like 500. Then in 2020 last year, the numbers go um, close to like uh, 700. Then this year doesn't look good. 2021 might be even higher. I will stop here for your question. Okay, thank you. So um, are there any questions from the commissioners so far in the data? Tony, I, I do have a question, Don Maziotti. Uh, Zhang uh -huh. that was a, that was a very good presentation. I, I'm wondering, uh, have you done a, a more specific geographic analysis of the concentration of the variety of uh, psychoactive heroin and other drugs? Yes, we, uh, we, we did do that. Yeah, this is really good question. Actually, if you look at that, because I did not uh, include it in the slides, you will find this kind of like a 19 county in mm -hmm. Oregon. Uh, if you count the number of deaths by drug, uh, 19 county, uh, their, their number of uh, opioid overdose deaths numbers bigger, or you think this is an odd number um, by their deaths due to mm -hmm. uh, stimulants, 19 county. Then another about uh, like a, a six county, they are about the same equal. Then another, I think it's a four or six county, uh, it's kind of like has more, uh, like a mass ma methamphetamine overdose than their opioid the, the overdose deaths. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks, Don. Uh, thank any of the other commissioners have questions? I think uh, Commissioner Cruz. Oh, yeah, uh, Commissioner Cruz, hop right in. Hey, so I'm just trying to figure out on the um, the map, were those numbers of deaths or were they per 100,000? How, how was that rated? Uh, this is, uh, yeah, the, the, the map just to show you that one is the rate, by rate is per 100, so yeah. Per 100, not, not yeah. actual numbers. Uh, no, yeah, no, this is, yeah, this is just uh, based on the, um, their, their instant then divided by population, yeah. Okay, good, because I would just try, because I know Multnomah and Wyoming are probably, are probably are too larger populations so, yeah okay yeah you're right so this is why i think the first uh, if you count the number then six the big population has a uh, county has a bigger number but by rate then you you, you can say it's kind of like a, for example motonoma or oh, motonoma county is definitely has a high number and high yeah. rate compared to washington county has a bigger pop population but the the number is not that big so the rate actually is down yeah Uh, uh, thanks, Caroline. Um, Judge Block. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, I had a question. I was a bit surprised by uh, the um, the mortality attributed to each of the various drugs. Uh, typically, when I think of of overdose deaths, I associate it with you know with opiates, either heroin or fentanyl, and uh, but actually, it looked like from your data the uh, the highest percentage of death is associated with methamphetamine. Is that just because of the sheer number of people who are using methamphetamine, or is there some some other um, mortality cause, you know, mortality cause that's associated there that that um, that I'm not that familiar with? Yeah, this is for the cause of death. This is um, the information has come from the medical examiner. Medical examiner will review the case also based on the toxicology results, then determine, say, okay, this is that's uh, contribute or uh, or caused by uh, like methamphetamine, fentanyl, or heroin. 
I think this is, this is determined by medical examiner. You question, I think it's kind of like, a, um, this is related to another issue, it's kind of like, a, for example, if you look, like, look, look at their toxicology results, you will find uh, like 40%, over 40% of them have, if you test uh, their blood, the find has uh, like a marijuana, also at, at about like 25 has mm. alcohol in their data, uh, in their body system. But the medical examiner will determine, say, okay, if this is, uh, their, their test show methamphetamine, also show fentanyl, they're based on the might be need to look at their, their concentration. If they think methamphetamine just in their data system, uh, in their uh, body system, but not the cause the death, then we're not at least as the cause of death. Mm. Work. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is why I think uh, you can say a lot of, uh, just mentioned nearly like 49% um, deaths test uh, uh, had, uh, uh, here at least is as cause of death, a mass methamphetamine. Then if you look at just the, the toxicology results, even higher the percentage and uh, the, uh, people is uh, test positive for their methamphetamine. Then mm. another issue is, I think it's kind of like, if you look at their uh, fentanyl overdose tests, uh, you will find this about like just 45, 47% uh, drug overdose tests are caused by uh, just the fentanyl alone, use alone. Another like 50 more percent uh, fentanyl related over deaths is caused by fentanyl plus another drug like methamphetamine, specifically cocaine, very common. It's kind of like a contribute to the deaths. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, hi, it's Brad. So, you know, the methamphetamine and the stimulants can, you know, cause death through a variety of mechanisms. Opioids, typically, it's the respiratory depression uh, and, and stopping breathing. Methamphetamines can cause uh, a stroke. They can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. uh, they can cause muscle breakdown, uh, leading to a massive protein load on the kidneys, leading to acute kidney failure. They can uh, cause hyperthermia, increased body temperature, which can cause death. So they have a lot of mechanisms. Yeah, by yeah. which they can cause death. So it is surprising because we do think of the standard right. uh, it's causing that, but uh, the stimulants have a lot of nasty effects. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Brad. I, yeah. I think it's kind of like if you look at this, uh, uh, because here today we don't have a lot of time to go through that. If you look mm. at that, you can say actually uh, there for two drug cause deaths a little bit different. Their pupil die from opioid overdose deaths are younger compared to the pupil die from uh, drug overdose of methamphetamine. They're younger for their, uh, like uh, you look at the uh, compare, I think uh, I look at the, uh, the pupil who die um, overdose of fentanyl, average age just uh, like 35, 36 years old. But you look at the, the fentanyl, uh, the methamphetamine. Uh, overdose, they're much older, older, older. might be like a 46, 10 years older. Yeah. So this, you can say is the, the, the fact is different. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. I'll hop in and just uh, have a quick question. So, you know, in, in the context of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission and our plan and our charge, you know, we're, we're wanting to reduce you know, um, death over time is in relation to substances through a very, various amount of mechanisms. Um, it looks like the opposite is happening. We're increasing deaths o over time, which is not good. Um, so my question to, to you guys is around um, the response to this internally. So when you guys notice that the prevalence is increasing over time, is there something that triggers a response? And is there a tiered response like, oh, look, like this is really bad. We need to adjust um, our approach. We need to inform A, B, and C to make sure we can ameliorate what's happening. Uh, so, does that happen internally? Tony, Don Manziotti, if it's okay, um, I'm I'm working the camps in Portland in the streets. Yeah, hold on. Hey, uh, 
Don, real quick, um, just, yeah. I'd like the, the presenters to be able to address my question that we can uh, get back to you. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this is really a good question. I will say, if you look at the picture, just uh, I show you data, you can see first is the uh, amount of this stat uh, due to the drug overdose deaths. Most of them had a mental health issue, has behavioral health issue, but they're not got a treatment. This is first. Second is kind of like a, you look at the drug, right now involve the drug, uh, illicit drug. They're easy to get from online, from straight. This is another issue is kind of like how to address this issue. If you put a, a lot of factors together, I think it's kind of like, a, a, I think needs some new policy or strategy to, to address this problem. It's not just like a public health or healthcare system or someone can do that, but we need, a, it's kind of like, a, um, multiple um, force or agency work together to gather a com comprehension um, approach to gather these things uh, to, to, to be uh, addressed this problem, to approach this, uh, this problem, yeah. Okay, and, and what I hear you saying is like, we need somebody to convene everybody to have a comprehensive approach to it. Um, and so I think that that is us to some degree. I think that's our, that's our charge. And so we appreciate you sharing the, the data with us. Um, uh, and I know Don, you already asked a question. I want to see in the <clears throat> interest of time. Is there anyone else who has any questions today? Or comments about this today? Yes. Being a very visual person, this is exactly, I think, what we've been wanting and what we needed. And you both, both presenters did an excellent job and uh, explaining it beyond just the picture, but explaining it into a deeper um, perspective from your perspective. But I think it was really an excellent presentation by both. I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Thank you for that. Um, oh, Nate, I see that you put your hand up and then we have Pat Garrett. So we'll go Nate and Pat. And Tony Biglin next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters, for this uh, incredible information. Um, I'm particularly interested in the um, length we can go back and uh, and compile this data from the unintentional drug overdose deaths. I know you you have it going back to quarter three of 2019. With all of those different um, measures for cocaine, heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamines, and total deaths. Can you go back um, like five years or 10 years or how far back can you go? Yeah, just at the beginning, I mentioned uh, the, the data right now we have, this called the data from their pseudos. This is, uh, we have data only from uh, July, 2019. You, you mentioned this data, we can, Get is kind of like use another data source like a death certificate. We can get some uh, data. It's not a, exactly the same, but it's kind of like just a, uh, not that detail as the pseudos, just um, I, I show this data. We can get some information up around that, but uh, uh, I will say um, we cannot uh, back to even like a five years, 10 years um, data. But I can tell you, it's kind of like, a, for example, for fentanyl, in uh, before the like a uh, two thousand eight nineteen eighteen, not many deaths. Might be I will say for the uh, twenty nineteen total drug overdose those deaths related to fentanyl, might be just uh, around like seven seventy seven zero, but uh, last year the number jumped to. 230. So you can see this, this is huge different, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just say that um, in the last few slides that we had, and Dr. Richardson, don't worry about bringing them back up, but in the last few slides of the presentation that are attached with the agenda, there are a couple of web links there to some data tools where you can go back and see how far the data go back, and then you can play around with some uh, demographics to your heart desire and get some geographic breakdowns as well. 
Yeah. Thank you. Also, it was very helpful. Yeah. Also, uh, if you, you are interested or want some like more information, you can, you can always send the email or contact with us. Yeah. Okay, appreciate that. Um, I think we had uh, Pat Garrett next, and we had Tony Biglin, and I see Dwight, you raised your hand as well. So go ahead, Pat. Hey, thanks, Tony. Uh, slide 21 was really impactful to me of the total unintended drug overdose deaths, 2.7% we're undergoing current treatment. To me, that's both jaw-dropping and hopeful. If the state of Oregon can ever, you know, get our treatment act together, oh my goodness, that's to me is amazing. Uh, and um, uh, I think, you know, I think we just keep 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 pushing, um, you know, treatment, interdiction, recovery. It makes a giant difference. And then a uh, follow-up question. So treatment, you know, that that. Those services, that community, not my wheelhouse. I'm wondering if is that I take it that's all treatment, you, even even you know outpatient, inpatient, any kind of treatment services that are being provided, that 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 all gets rolled up into that into that statistic. Is that a fair fair statement? Absolutely. Is that thank Tony? you. Tony, I mean, I think that's absolutely right, and. Uh, OHA is, you know, going to receive, assuming that public health is included in the bill that I hope is going to pass soon, it includes a hell of a lot of money for behavioral health issues of one kind or another, and we ought to be looking at the policy environment in which the allocation of those funds uh, are going to be established. Um, Tony, big line, and then uh, we'll get Dwight if we have time. Yeah, I agree that this, these were excellent presentations, and given that they're recorded, I wonder if it would be possible to make this available on the internet. Uh, there are a lot of citizens of Oregon who, who need to be informed about this. Uh, the other thing is that, that Vicki mentioned the CDC uh, materials on uh, alcohol-related deaths, and I heard her say enforcement, access, taxation, reduced advertising. And it seems to me that we should look systematically at the degree to which Oregon is addressing each of those. And we're hoping that that'll be your recommendations in our next agenda item, Tony, from your subcommittee, <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, Dwight, uh, go ahead and hop in and then, and then we'll let our guests go. Dwight, are you there? Okay, we'll have Dwight follow up with any other uh, questions. Thank you guys so much. Um, just one last little request from me. You know, the, these uh, these data points are incredibly important. Um, you know, and I'm hoping that one day there's going to be a live dashboard that we can go review. Um, is that something that you guys are working towards? Yeah, actually, we have a data dashboard. Um, you can look at our website. This is it's kind of like a, a not a data dashboard. is based on the uh, death certificate data. Right now, we have this, this new data system. We are working on that. We hope it's kind of like can quickly can get uh, some data or information out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. We do have, there are several OHA data dashboards and it's clear that we do need some better coordination in order to make something more comprehensive and a little bit more one-stop shop. And we're trying to do that with um, the Healthier Together Oregon data dash, data scorecard, which is which is linked in the presentation. We're kind of putting all of those things together to show the whole picture, but yeah, we're a little data siloed and we're working on that. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I'm, and I'm hoping that as we kind of curtail the um, COVID pandemic, we can have a similar response, comprehensive response to this pandemic, which has been going on for a while. So any support we can give you guys in getting you the tools you need to publicize that data really quickly, real time would be best, of course, you know, I get presumptive data, you know, around COVID on my phone every single day. So I think I think we could do something similar to this, we've demonstrated that we can if we will. Um, so Tony, really, uh, it's coming. 
Oh, Dwight, they, we got you. Yep. Sorry, sorry, not sure. My, one of my, what, the microphone is not currently not working. Um, I, I just wanted to weigh in and say, I think uh, echoing what others have handed out, this is our moment. You know, this is a moment for the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission to provide the kind of coordinated, um, um, rapid response that's essential for this public health emergency. Yeah, also, I, I, I will say this way. Our uh, uh, injury prevention program, uh, we have like a monthly uh, data report uh, distributed to, I think, over 700 um, people receive that, uh, have monthly uh, update, gave like a, a number of deaths, uh, all, all over those deaths, by monthly, uh, gave a preliminary number but at least give people information, yeah. Thank you so much, and I agree 100% with you, Dwight. Um, thanks, guys, for coming. I'm sure we'll, we'll invite you back. If if things get um, really bad or they increase or something, can you guys make a commitment just to letting us know quickly so that we can respond accordingly in the future? <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's getting towards the end of the year, so we should have another year's of um, finalized data within the next couple months. So if it's um, worth your while to have us back just to get that a single year update, we can do that as well. Sure, we yeah. might just send, send an additional report to the governor's office if you guys feel like it. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to throw, that, gather, throw, yeah, throw that out the information out <laughs> as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank cool. you. All right. Th thank you guys so much. Uh, uh, Reggie, were you going to say something, Dr. Richardson? Yeah, just uh, Vicki, before you go, when would be a good time for you to come back when you guys have all of that information uh, ready to present? Probably early next year. I mean, data is usually finalized before the end of the year. Um, I don't want to make too many promises because the world is behind schedule these days, it seems. But usually we get the previous year's data before the end of the next year. Yeah, another thing, I think 2020, last year, the census data has kind of like delayed. So it might be, I think, I think it might be, hopefully we can get the report early. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. Yeah, thank you guys so much. OK, moving on uh, to our next agenda item. Uh, which couldn't be any more timely, which is the prevention subcommittee, which I know has been working really, really hard. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to um, Dr. Tony Biglin. Thank you. Uh, hopefully Tori will help me with this. Uh, the members of the subcommittee are Jessica Kronz, uh, Richard, uh, Reginald Richardson, Don Maziotti, myself, uh, Tatiana Deerwerkter, uh, Jessica Newworth, uh, Victoria Bulo, um, Dwight Holton, Tony Vizina, uh, Carolyn Cruz, Pamela Pierce, and Jill Gray. Uh, we met uh, on, I believe, the, oh, I've forgotten when it was, uh, about three weeks ago. Um, and the subcommittee worked on the question of the objectives and priority activities. Uh, we tried to get clear on uh, how counties are organized. This, this is one of the things that came up that wasn't uh, directly uh, on our agenda, but Dwight pointed out that uh, there was once a, a drug and alcohol uh, prevention effort in every county uh, that was folded into the uh, Oregon Health Authority and changed that and we realized that we don't actually know, have a, the, the information we need about what funds are flowing to counties uh, relevant to the prevention of all of the substance use uh, issues. And so um, one of the things we decided was that we, we really needed to get on top of that. Um, I, uh, by coincidence, uh, was in contact with uh, Marie Bowman Davis, who is the head of public health in Washington County. And she provided me with some information that helped to begin to identify some of the funding streams uh, that are going for prevention. But the Oregon Health Authority is not the only entity that's uh, funding those things. And so one of the things we need to do is get on top of all of the funds that are flowing to any aspect of, the, the, of or programming that might be relevant to prevention. And there are a lot of them, not just things that are specifically focused on uh, substance use, 
but any things that are reducing the risk factors for substance use. Uh, and, and that, so there are things, education is relevant, uh, as well as uh, uh, Oregon Health Authority efforts, the CCO efforts, and so on. So, um, Tori, could you uh, remind me exactly what our steps are on getting clear on, on what the counties are doing? You're on mute. Thank you. Um, I apologize in advance. They are blowing leaves, so hopefully you guys won't hear it. Okay. <clears throat> So we um, looked at the prioritized um, strategies and activities and from that list chose uh, two, uh, two topics to focus on. And then we built a work group uh, to focus on one of those two topics and they uh, relate to family intervention. Were you asking about those questions that we came up with? Well, I, I was going to describe those, but I, I I couldn't remember exactly what our next steps were in terms of getting clear on what uh, the the counties are, uh, what's going on at the county level. I, I will say that it's clear it's that it's different for different counties. What we've decided to do is to sponsor a, a one day symposium where we plan to invite the counties to, to uh, revigorate the um, meeting among the prevention specialists around the county and to figure out what's happening. So we have some questions that we're going to be proposing uh, doing that symposium to kind of get a sense of what is <coughs> prevention uh, that's happening around the state through each county. Thank you. Go ahead, Tori. Didn't describe the other work group. Definitely. Um, and so we have a action oriented uh, work group who will focus on um, family interventions, uh, evidence based family interventions. And uh, we came up with some questions to get a better understanding of those um, evidence based family interventions. And this is in essence what our work group will work to get the answers to. Those questions are, uh, there's four questions. What tribal based practices, evidence based uh, programs are in use to assist families that can prevent substance misuse? You know what guys, instead of reading this to you, I'm going to present it. Give me just a second. All right. Can you guys see it? Awesome. Yes. So these are the four key questions again. Uh, we're looking first at tribal based practices uh, slash evidence based programs that are in use currently. We want to know how are families being reached? Are programs that serve families scalable and, and or sustainable? And then finally, what is needed to improve the program? And if I May, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is reach out to some of the entities that would have their arms around these the answers to these questions. One of those is the Oregon Parent Education Collaborative, which is a consortium of uh, foundations in the state that have been working for the last 10 years on the systems uh, for reaching parents. And so, um, uh, Pam Pierce and I are working on scheduling a meeting with three representatives of OPEC and I think that'll provide us with a lot of information. And I think that uh, Reginald and Tori are going to reach out to the Oregon Health Authority's uh, leadership with respect to family programs. Do I have that right? That's correct. Okay. And then uh, in addition, with respect not only to families, but with respect to prevention per se. Uh, I met last uh, Friday with the uh, with Colt Gill and some of his staff at the Oregon Department of Education. And so that there's some relevancy there to families, but there's also relevancy to the question of assessment 
of uh, adolescent substance use, which is a strong predictor of uh, later substance use disorders and so on. Um, he pointed out something that I had not considered, and that is that the pushback and criticism and um, tr mistrust by parents of schools is at an all-time high, and that that's one of the reasons that it has become more difficult to get schools to uh, be willing to do the Oregon Healthy Teens or its successor, which is uh, is intended to be done um, every two years. Uh, this is one of our priorities, uh, you know, for the prevention subcommittee is to get better data. Uh, a community that doesn't have data on how its kids are doing is flying blind with respect to prevention. So uh, ODE has promised to get back to us with uh, some help uh, on these questions. Uh, we in our in our first subcommittee meeting, we discussed the possibility of adding people to the committee. And in my conversations with people, I find myself not wanting to necessarily have them involved beyond the committee, though I'm open to it, but rather to draw from them uh, information that would be relevant to, to what we need to know and, and to help them to be allies to us in working on this. I've also had conversations with people in uh, the prevention program at the University of Oregon. John Seeley is the uh, associate dean for research there, uh, is a prevention scientist himself. He's working with OHA on issues of uh, suicide prevention. He has a set of graduate students who he is recruiting to help us. So I think we can get some significant help with respect to what we know or what is known about uh, prevention in these different areas and how we can move that forward. Uh, they might also be helpful in reaching out to people to survey them about uh, issues that would be helpful to us. Um, we, I think we're cementing some good contacts with the foundations through the work with OPEC. Uh, and I have also reached out to one of the heads of the CCO in Yamhill County, but I have not heard back from them. I think we need CCO representation. Um, I think that's about what we have on our list. Tori, what did I miss? Um, I think you captured it. Our prevention uh, subcommittee meets um, monthly and our evidence-based family interventions work group meets twice a month. Um, also, just as a sidebar, Mike Marshall, did you know you're sharing your screen? Yeah, Mike. <clears throat> FYI, Mike Marshall. Yeah. Turning your camera on. Kick that little box with the X in it. There you go. Oh. My apologies. No worries, dude. Gosh, you know, don't apologize yet. You know, <laughs> we didn't see nothing, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, that's so uh, secure here. That Mike, someone so, else can share that's this. scary. It looks like uh, it looks like we got Jill Archer has has raised her hand. So go ahead and and um, you know pitch your question or whatever you have for the prevention subcommittee. Thank you. I was just um, remembering like a long time ago there used to be the Commission on Children and Families, and a lot of the alcohol and drug prevention funding right. went there, and then that shifted to early learning hubs. So I guess I'm just wondering if the funding went there or just went away. Or I know mean, that's what you're looking for, but I'm just. Like having this moment of remembering there was a lot of work that the commissions did yes. related to prevention well we're trying to get on top of that uh and it, it's it's complex both in the sense that there are a lot of different entities that are uh you know shoveling uh, funds to the counties but also because the counties are differently organized they're not all doing this in the same way and, and it's further complicated by the fact that much of what is needed to prevent substance use is not labeled substance use. Uh, programs on social emotional learning in schools, uh, you know, things of that sort uh, have a significant benefit in preventing uh, substance use disorders, but they don't necessarily get thought about that way. So we're working on that. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, 
all right, we're out of time, but I just wondered if we could just give like um, <clears throat> Tony and, and the prevention subcommittee just like some some fingers or some clapping or something, whatever we want to do. Well, <clears throat> just let, for, me, for, let me applaud Tori. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for all your help on this. Uh, yeah, she's she's true. leading us on this. Thank you. Tori's super sharp too, you know, so thanks Tori. Um, uh, and if you need any help from any of us, I know time's short today, but feel free to reach out. I'm happy to support in any way we can. Um, next, we have uh, Morgan Godman and Nate Galleyrand to talk about the Measure 110 Evaluation Work Group. And, you know, we're really fortunate to have two of our members, or wait, three of our members now, kind of, I guess Dr. Richardson's kind of like ex officio or whatever to the uh, Oversight Accountability Council, but there is good linkage there. So you guys want to give us an update on the all the progress around the evaluation <laughs> metrics for measure 110 yeah thank you mr chair um morgan and i met earlier this week and uh, she's going to tackle some of the treatment aspects um associated with the work group but i just wanted this group to know that oha has convened a stakeholder evaluation of ballot measure 110 um we've met twice now and uh, the first time was more about introductions and we've had pretty robust conversations offline through emails and and um, and other um, venues such as the the virtual platforms and so on and so forth and so um, some of those efforts are are being there, there's some fruit to them and um, wanted to share with you some of the recommendations that um, have been discussed we uh, just wanted to make sure that you understood that it's different than the Oversight and Accountability Council, although there's uh, lots of duplicate membership uh, there. But it's really aimed towards um, looking at the intent of Ballot Measure 110 and then evaluating what it is that we've done as a state. So if you remember, the intent of Ballot Measure 110 was really to uh, remove people from the criminal justice system, get folks um that are struggling with drugs the help that they need also increase resources and address the racial disparity uh issues among some of our um citizens so um ojd has a report that they've been running for quite some time it has morphed a little bit uh, including some of the demographics that some of our stakeholders have uh, said we need to make this a priority and then we've taken a look at the citations versus the actual calls to lines for life and just some of the conversations that we've been having is there might be some other factors that we need to include in that measurement um, and not just say it's not working in terms of getting treatment engagement from the citations but um, that seems to be some of the complexities that we need to work through, I think, as this work group convenes and um, and has some pretty difficult discussions. Um, so, Tori, would you mind pulling up the recommended metrics uh, in that spreadsheet first? And we can talk a little bit about that. I don't have it. I have it ready. So as you pull that up, I just wanted to float this idea that the work group is mindful of um, correlated factors as well as causal of factors and being careful not to make assumptions that ballot measure 110 has, um, you know, for example, increased, let's say, homelessness for, you know, uh, for one factor. Is that a is ballot measure 110 a causal effect of homelessness? We don't necessarily know that at this point. Um, so those are some of the discussions that we're having. And um, Dr. Richardson, can it, you present it? It's not showing up as one of my addendum, sorry. I might be able to present it to Tori if it's easier that way. Oh, there we go. Gotcha. There we go. So that's the um, Judicials Department 
metrics and report out for ballot measure 110 since it's been implemented as of February 1st. Lots of really good information. If you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to peruse it. This might be something that we continue to advocate for as it relates to the metrics and the evaluation of ballot measure 110 moving forward. There has been some discussion um, among local stakeholders here in Southern Oregon because we lead the state in the citations of PCS. Um, so possession of controlled substance for those of you that don't know what PCS stands for. And, um, and so we're doing a, a lot of legwork uh, just to formulate some measurables on the evaluation of ballot measure 110 as we implement that and learn from one another and um, and then move forward as a state. So uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll turn the attention to Morgan for some uh, some additional information on that work group. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to back it up a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, what the OAC just did because it has a lot to do with this data work group. So, we just passed the Behavioral Health Resource Network grant proposals. It took us many weeks to do that, and they still have not been released by OHA because there's some budget calculations that are still being made. So according to Department of Justice, the way Senate Bill 755 was written, we have to distribute all of that money out to Burns, or at least in a, enough to put the beha Burn Behavioral Health Resource Network all across the state and if there's any money left after that we can add additional access to care funds but this will all be done quite quickly so starting perhaps in about a week we'll start receiving the grants and reviewing them what this means for our system as a whole is by the end of the year somewhere in the ballpark of 270 million dollars will be um, assigned out to organizations to provide substance use disorder services across the state. And so this is a really pivotal point because that is a huge influx of money. I'm not sure what our total expenditures on this in the state are, but we're not an incredibly large state. So $270 million is quite a chunk of change. But then we get to the when it comes to data, it's hard to how do you measure success? when we've had difficulty just measuring where we are in the past. And so this has been an ongoing infamous problem. Um, so I know Dr. Waddell's listening in right now. She's doing the inventory um, and we'll be hearing from her next month, right? Or getting an update on her work. So that's just sort of like where we are now. But so what Measure 110 did, it, its intent was to take substance use out of the domain of the criminal justice sphere and put it into the public health sphere. And because of that, the success or shortcomings of Measure 110 or any potential any potential health benefit it is providing or not providing is not captured by nor correlated to the number of police citations issued. But law enforcement has excellent data and we have we, we are the data on the treatment and recovery side is much more difficult. It is, is it is disintegrated, it is siloed. And so what we're looking at right now is heavily law enforcement related data because they have an integrated data system and that data is much easier to grasp and comprehend. So as we move forward in this work group, we haven't talked about it so much yet. This work group is, is in its very early stages. We had an introductory meeting and then a meeting last Friday. We're just, you know, it's just really basic measures of how do we measure success? And then, so what are our metrics for treatment success going to be? What are our metrics for recovery success going to be? And then how do we measure those going forward if we were not necessarily measuring them in the past? So if we don't have a, a comparative baseline. And, but again, I think perhaps just because of the data access we have available, we have been um, focusing, at least in the beginning, a lot on law, law enforcement data. So here, being shared on the screen right now, is potential data metrics um, that we're talking about using to evaluate the success of Measure 110. And so we have treatment engagement, justice system engagement, resources, and then it's broader than that, right? Because substance use affects all spheres of our life. So we also have employment, healthcare. Um, 
I'm not sure if housing on her or housing retention I heard discussed. But this uh, this work group is in its very early stages and there are a there are a lot of people providing opinion. But if anyone on the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission, if any of my fellow commissioners um, have a strong opinion about this, Julia Dilley, who is administering the group, is holding open office hours every week to take the expertise of the community to intake this feedback because you know this it, it's a huge influx of money and it is a radical change to the system and this is a very pivotal point where we need the engagement of people who have been doing this work for years and who have the expertise to provide so please if if you know that any of these points are your specialty please engage with us okay thanks morgan and nate um and tony i see that you got your hand up um Big Lynn, so I'll go ahead and let you hop in. Um, just before we get into questions, can either of you provide the commissioners with a timeline around when you're collecting information and when that is going to be finalized? So the group is meeting every week right now, and um, there is a schedule for it um, for the next couple of months, and I can get that to the commission um, for follow up. but. There, there are, as uh, Morgan had referenced, there are some other opportunities to engage. You can engage with us via email or, or telephone or whatever that you think uh, um, is going to get our attention and start weighing in on some of this information because it's very important that we get accurate metrics and that we're comparing apples to apples and we're not making assumptions for um, ballot measure 110 on what causes this or that or the other thing if it's if it's not um, supported with data and so that's what we're we're trying to aim uh, for this particular work group just getting accurate information and being able to measure what it is that uh, ballot measure 110 is doing for our state and if you could slide us that um the individual's email you referenced morgan uh, yeah. somehow it's really helpful appreciate it okay so go ahead tony biglin uh, yes, um, last month we had a report on the availability of uh, treatment providers and learned that there's a great shortage of treatment providers. Um, and so I'm wondering to what extent the funds that are going to be start flowing are going to increase the salaries of people who are providing, uh, since that's a well-known factor affecting whether or not people go to the work, but also what money is being made available to train people in uh, providing treatment? Yeah, so those are excellent questions and we have talked about them at length on the OAC. Essentially what it's looking like is, so organizations, we, we did not cap, um, the grant requests per organization. So we have a, you know, we have a cap on the total funds available but because that is per the budget. But then as we distribute it, we are hoping and we have tried to make clear verbally and we will offer a series of webinars to provide technical assistance to organizations. Um, the asks in these grants are actually quite flexible. So if you would like to use this grant money to increase the, your baseline salaries, 20% of all your staff, that is a very viable option. And if you wanna take this grant and, and have a 10% of this grant is going in to pay for the education of your staff, including training new staff members, getting CADCs, peer recoveries, the, the different certifications for recovery, peer mentorship, like was discussed earlier, that sort of um, pre-treatment peer engagement that is completely funded and so that those are the types of services and that is category excluded from Medicaid so these are this is a really important alternative funding structure that can be used to fill some of these gaps to raise salaries to increase people's training and pay for things that insurance and Medicaid have historically not paid for uh, one, one more question H have you is there any effort to reach out to the universities and, and community colleges where the training might be provided? OHA and the OAC haven't taken that on directly. I think, and maybe erroneously, we have sort of kicked that down to the organizations that would be coordinating this, but I think that's a wonderful idea. And there, uh, just to hop in real quick and I'll let some other people go. Um, uh, Dr. Richardson, is it okay if we cut your portion a little short? Uh, absolutely. 
OK, so we can continue with that. There, there is alternative uh, uh, efforts to increase workforce retention and education that are happening through the legislature, and a lot of that's using ARPA dollars and stuff. So it is happening, you know, at the same time. I don't know if they're 100 percent connected, but there, there is that coordination going on. Um, go ahead. Uh, I don't know who was first, Dwight or Eric Block. I'll let Dwight go first. Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks, uh, Morgan, for that excellent report. Um, I, I, I agree with you. You're right about the fact that law enforcement has better data, so um, so that's we need to take that in context. At the same time, what um, my very strong perception from both the data and from relationships and conversations with addiction treatment providers around the state is that what we are seeing is that we and we knew we were doing this. We did it on, we as a state did it on purpose. We've taken down what was a very effective bridge to recovery, and we have not replaced it. And it's okay, but as the council considers how to spend money, and this but just to be clear, Alliance for Life doesn't do this work, so I, I have no stake in this. I am desperate for you guys to focus like a laser on figuring out what it takes to get people in treatment, not just the crowd that used to be law enforcement handled, but a broad spectrum from the um, uh, middle-aged guy who drinks too much to folks living in health system situations and everywhere in between. Um, because I think that's where that investment's got to be, given that we've taken this one bridge down, we got to build those other bridges in. And I worry a little bit that there are some folks who don't want to kind of under we don't want to accept that that bridge is gone and that we're not getting the, we're not replacing it. That's where we are. That's the reality. So I urge you guys to lean heavily into that. And I know you share that interest, Morgan. Yeah, I completely the criminal justice system actively sought people out, right? It is a very active system. And currently. Um, you know, so what can we replace it with? How can we be equally as active, but far less harmful? Because while yes, maybe one out of every five people that came in contact with the criminal justice system did use that as an on-ramp to recovery and was benefited, that does not negate the harms that were being committed on the, uh, the four out of five majority of people. So I do have some personal bias against that framing, I'll be honest. <laughs> Um, but I totally agree with you that we cannot just sit back on our hands and wait for people to walk in the door. Okay, and the strategies we are we are developing must be active, and this is where peer mentors and outreach will come into play, and that is how we can fill the gap. So right now you are completely correct, Dwight. We have a gap. No one is doing this active. Our, our system current is, is a passive system, and I think outreach will be the key to that. Yeah, uh, Morgan, I'd be I'd be out selling recovery every day. We're moving we're moving on uh, <laughs> to uh, Judge Block. You did. Uh, Dw Dwight made m the point about you know we we need to not only increase those resources but we need to build the connective tissue between where the people are and get them in. I mean the criminal justice system. I don't disagree with your characterization sort of generally of the system. I think in drug courts, you know, we we do better than that than the whole system, but the whole system is is fairly destructive. But one thing we we were able to do was to create a, 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 a sort of a pivot point for folks to either do treatment or suffer a consequence. And since treatment and change is really hard, you know, sometimes the alternative has to feel worse. And I think, you know, it, outside the criminal justice system, we don't have that 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 punishment or that compelling power. But so we can't we we can't rely upon sticks. We need carrots. And how are we going to incentivize? And I'm hoping some of the funding is going to go to sort of creatively um, developing those types of incentives to get people into the system. In the interest of time, it sounds like we were recommending that we somehow capture outreach and engagement, intervention, stuff like that as, as these burns are, are taking off and being operationalized. Uh, Brad Anderson and uh, Ken. Um, yeah, I mean, what am I going to say, Tony? You know what I'm going to say. We are mostly ignoring uh, the the biggest provider of health care, which is commercial insurance in the state. Sixty some percent of Oregonians have private health insurance and Kaiser. We have our own department. I don't think there's another private 
uh, insurer who does. We need to get them to play ball because they're using the community programs and we need more bricks and mortar, but we need to get them here. I've been saying this for what, how many years I've been on this commission and, and nothing's been done. I think I'm the only treatment provider on this uh, commission, right? Criminal justice system is well represented on this commission, and I'm the only person left here who actually talks to patients with dis this disease. I think Willie's gone, right? He's mm -hmm. not on the commission anymore. So yeah, I'm going to keep banging on this till my term is up. Um, we need to get uh, Providence, the other players involved. Nothing's going to change. The state can only do so much. Uh, Smaller treatment programs can only do so much. Um, the money is in the insurance, and we've got to change that, folks. We've learned a ton uh, during the pandemic how to treat folks virtually. That's great stuff that we can share. We can treat people all over the state, and we've got great learnings that we can share, and it's pretty inexpensive. But if we get that those dollars into people who can use uh, technology to get treatment. Is it ideal? Not at all. We'd rather be face to face with each other, right? But can we do it? Yes. Can we get treatment to people all over the state virtually? Yes, we can. Treatment, treatment, treatment. We saw it today, right? 90% of the people or greater who died had never been involved in any kind of treatment. And the other thing we don't have represented here is primary care. Primary care is absolutely critical to start to have an input in terms of prevention, early access. And yeah, I started off in family medicine, so I know and I teach family medicine docs all the time how to talk to patients about this. We need family medicine, internal medicine throughout the state in hospitals and ERs involved in helping out with this and I I'll say it until I'm done um, and I think I'm done. OK, thanks, Brad. I totally agree with you and, and that's something we can definitely talk about and focus on. Uh, I'll go to Kat and then we'll wrap up and we'll go to uh, Dr. Richardson. So I'm I'm just wondering what um, what's currently there to get somebody from ticket to treatment and like it sounds like there's a huge gap there, but is there any sort of anything going on or are you are we just saying okay here's your ticket or law enforcement says okay here's your ticket and then like it you you won't have to pay this if you go to treatment or is there any sort of like broadcast from say you know where, where i'm at douglas county sheriff's office to adapt which is our local public health um agency to say like hey look out for this guy or or reach out to them or anything like that So right now, we're it's it's the ticket, and the citation. I saw it for the first time during our data evaluation, and it just made me. It's convoluted. It is not clear when you look at the citation what is the next step. So that's something when I look at the notes from our last data evaluation. This um, <laughs> clarity and and continuity across all jurisdictions, where it is very clear what is the next step because right now this is a huge shortcoming. And so that's why I'm very excited that we're about to get $270 million injected in the system. And as for what, and then people are not calling the number on the citation, right? We already know this. We've identified a huge problem. People aren't calling. And if uh, Commissioner Holton wants to talk to that, he can. Yeah, so do I, I'll let you hop in, but then we're gonna move on. Okay, um, is, just- wait, 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 before you go, before you start, Dwight, Chair, um, what I have to say will take just a couple of minutes, and I think this is a really important conversation. So with your permission, we, sure. could, we could extend it. OK, go ahead, Dwight. Commissioner Morgan, what else, Goblin, rather, um, I'm with you 100%. I have been trying to get OJD to add Measure 110 to the uniform citation. I thought they were going to do it back in January, February of last year. By July, it seemed like it was kind of a, well, so I've mentioned that to Rep Sanchez. I've mentioned to the governor's office. I mentioned to the speaker's office that we need to get that going. I'd love to see that on you guys' radar as well. You know, when you get a speeding ticket or whatever, it's a very clear ticket. It tells you exactly what to do, and and they have a very high compliance rate. So I'm hopeful we can head that direction. You're muted, Morgan. 
Thank you. <laughs> uh, I completely agree. It needs to be so much more clear than it is, but we will still encounter a problem because we know the gulf between people who use drugs and police officers are is still very wide. So if a police it, during an incident of police contact and when I talked to the Columbia County Sheriff, he said they were still seizing like you know, taking away people's drugs because it's still illegal. It's not legal and to, as evidence of the citation. So a cop just, you know, a cop that you're afraid of because of whatever has happened in your life, stopped you, took your drugs and wrote you a ticket and then like buried in the very bottom corner of the number of that ticket, it says assessment and a phone number. So cl clearly we have so much, like first it needs to be better visually. And then we just need to increase word of mouth among people, you know, who are actually struggling, increase brick and mortars. Because right now, just like a phone number is never going to cut it. We need active outreach and we need brick and mortars and we need word of mouth to spread among people. Because I think as long as the number's only coming from police or the what next is coming from police, there will always be a bit of a gap. But that being said, it could be so much better than it is now. Because right now, if you give me that ticket, I wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> Okay, so it sounds to me like we're we're all on the same page uh, about what should happen, and, and have no doubt that we're gonna figure it out. You know, we also we also need access to detox if somebody does get you know an intervention that encourages them to go to treatment, and the next step in that pathway is closed, then it disincentivizes. So there's a lot of work to be done. I think we're gonna figure it out over the next five years. Uh, I'm sure we'll we'll get there. It's it's the the long game at this point. Um, uh, go ahead. Dr. Richardson, talk about the survey. Thank you. So all of you would have received from me an email with a link to a um, survey for the commission uh, members. Um, as of last check, there were only 13 of you who completed it. I just wanted to encourage you to complete the survey. Um, it will be helpful as we plan um, how we do this work together. And so if you haven't done it, please check your email and go on and complete the survey. Yeah, so far it's still only 13 people responded. So uh, the other housekeeping thing I wanted to mention, uh, remember that all of our meetings are public meetings uh, pursuant to the Public Meetings Act. And therefore all of our chat activity is also part of our meeting and um, is public and can be released uh, if requested. So when we are um, writing things in the chat, we wanna make sure that we are not only writing them to ourselves, but also to the public. So I would just remind you that the meetings are recorded and the chat is also recorded in public. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, I'd like to open up public comment. I did notice that Kat, you you had put something in the chat in the very beginning about something relative to new expungement uh, requirements or something like that. And I was just wondering if you wanted to talk about how the new expungement statute made it easier to get expunged. I, am, I don't do expungements. I just know that they recently okay. changed the statute that sh it shortened a lot of the time frames. Um, for that, and I think it adjusted the look back period, but I'm not very well versed in um, in what and how those changes are actually implemented. Just because I deal with people on the front end, not the back end. Okay, yeah, no worries. Um, I just thought that was kind of neat. Okay, anybody else from uh, the public? Is there anybody from the public that wants to chime in? Chair, before you move to public, also um, Dr. Neeson put something in the chat that that might be interesting to bring uh, commissioners attention to if you sure. give her a moment uh maybe she'll speak to what she put in the chat yeah yeah thanks for catching that uh go ahead dr neeson hi everybody um good afternoon good to be with you i just uh as morgan's presentation and as we're just talking about the death loss destruction um these are deeply moral issues and i know that you know we're 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 often talking about policy and you know very complicated um political issues that are on the table but at the end of the day um we're talking about deeply moral issues and i just happened to run across 
um, this article recently from the from JAMA called The Moral Determinants of Health, uh, written by some physicians. And I just thought it was worth sharing um, because I think it is a central, there just isn't a lot of time to explore that. And um, perhaps at some point um, that needs to be elevated and amplified as a part of our appeal and our work. It's there in between every other thing we do, but it's good to explicitly go there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, or I'm um, sorry, Dr. Neeson. Um, okay, do we have anybody from the public who would like to comment? Chair, um, Judge Block has his hand up. Okay, oh, go ahead, Judge Block. Oh, I was just going to um, uh, suggest uh, that um, relating to this issue of expungement and then also a bill that I think we had discussed, uh, Senate Bill 819, which basically allows for the uh, an individual with the support of the DA to seek just uh, more than expungement, almost like a clean slate, a wipe away of of one or 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 all um all convictions potentially um maybe uh uh cat and i can work together and maybe uh make a presentation to the commission on that at some at some future meeting also chair um, uh, representative solman's uh, chief of staff nicole vargas put a, a comment in the chat on senate bill 397 which is the expungement bill. Perhaps, uh, Nicole, can you unmute and, and talk a little bit about what that bill involves? I knew you were going to put me on the spot, and of course, now <laughs> I just remember the bill and it went um, uh, it went completely out of my head, but I knew the number, so I wanted to share the <laughs> link so people could look it up. Okay, maybe uh, Judge Block and Kat could um, add that to their presentation and do yeah. a whole thing on expungement for us. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for catching all that. There was a, there was a lot of activity in the, the chat today, uh, which is great. Uh, okay, we're going one more time from, from the public sphere. Anybody want to hop in and comment? Uh, yeah, I'll pop in. Um, I was listening, so something that jumped out at me was what um, Mr. Anderson was Please saying. Dennis, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm Caitlin Ruderman. I'm uh, an MSW, Master's of Social Work, um, and I right now I'm in Michigan, but I'm moving to Oregon in January. Um, and I, I'm i a clinical social worker, but I'm also very interested in policy and, and um, community engagement and things like that. So I wanted to kind of join in and see what, what y'all were working on. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I just, I'm curious um, what what Bradley Anderson was saying about their, him being the only provider on the commission. Um, you know, coming from a social work perspective, I very much believe that there's, it's really important to have the micro clinical um, perspective melded with the macro um, policy perspective. And I'm curious if there's any initiative about trying to incorporate more of the micro perspective, because those are the people that are on the ground engaging with um, the people that are suffering with this stuff. And, you know, things like the, the um, convoluted ticket thing, like, it's great that that was caught. But that's something that, like, who knows what other things there are that are impacting the the experience of the people that are struggling with this. So I was just wondering if there's anything going on for that. Chair, do you want me to take that or do you want to take it? Yeah, I'll let you handle that one. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Great social work question. Um, Dr. Laura Neeson, who's a former dean of the School of Social Work at Portland State University, I'm sure is proud to hear uh, your question. Um, we are a policy board, so we are macro in our, our focus. Um, what we do is to provide, uh, hopefully, the big picture. Um, and we have, at various times, had lots of iterations of 
membership, including direct practitioners. Uh, currently, our membership doesn't have direct practitioner, practitioners other than Dr. Um, Anderson, who's a physician, and he's our lone physician at the moment on our commission. So uh, there's nothing in our bylaws or in the law that governs our work that says we can't have more on the ground uh, folks, if you will, but that's just the appointments that have occurred during this this cycle. Um, and partially because of what I said, we're a policy board. Aren't aren't I the only physician who's ever been on a commission though? Are you, no, you are you are not. Who is the uh, who is the other one? Prior to my tenure, there were uh, when the commission was originally uh, conceived of, there were other physicians. And and there have, there's not been, to my knowledge, a uh, counselor who's done residential counseling. Um, and there, so it's been. Well, I'm sure the core of our work. Well, I, I I I don't want to get into that debate. I, I think oh, it's not a debate. Think. It's simply the fact that there aren't uh, other. Uh, there are not. Uh, patient or uh, people who have direct contact either on an outpatient or a residential um, on the commission. So well, you've made that. you've made that point repeatedly. And the point I was trying to make until you interrupted me was that we were not going to have that. This is not the place or time for that discussion. That was what I was trying to say. Thank you. If and I might, if I might just chair. also uh, this is Laura. If I might just also say, Caitlin, I do think um, there have been there are various times in the life of the commission that there's a lot of community dialogue about policy options or strategic direction and at those times there have been large and small community meetings and town hall kind of events where there's a lot of consumer input and the sharing of micro experiences that has actually really shaped um, a lot of our strategy along the way. So I guess I just wanted to offer that. But hey, and, shout out to social work, right on. Yeah, and you know, and I'll just say, you know, I I, I am a social worker. Uh, I'm a person with lived experience. I, I work and run a program that provides recovery services. I do a lot of technical assistance, community organizing. Uh, we do have a lot of participation from local community advocates, including Oregon Recovers, which is a very uh, grassroots focus organization. So those those things are filtering up. What, what I'd like to see is that um, you continue your energy and perseverance when you come to Oregon and, and participate in these discussions with us and you're feel, uh, feel free to join and, and provide any recommendations that you have. We really appreciate that and we could use more of what you brought today from the community in our efforts. Um, anybody else from uh, the public who wants to chime in? This might be the only meeting where Mike Marshall doesn't talk, and it's going to be a historic moment. <laughs> so <laughs> it's okay because he took over the whole screen, so maybe he's, he did. <laughs> that's good <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I just want to say, you know, if if we close a little bit early, that um, you know, I'm just really proud of the commission and and how far we've come since I've joined it and the texture of our conversations and the people we have on it and our ability to you know work with the oversight and accountability council even though there was some pressure and tension there and, and and we're just like i feel like we're weaving it together over time it's just taking a long time because oregon system's really dysfunctional and, and we're trying to fix it and everybody wants to do a good job it's, it's the system that that we're at work against and so just thank you guys so much and it's always a pleasure to come to the commission meetings um, again, if anybody wants to chat about how I could do a better job um, facilitating or bringing people in, please let me know. You have my phone number that that's extended to you uh, as well, Caitlin, from out of town uh, when you get here, you know, open book. Appreciate y'all. Uh, is there anything else anybody would like to say before we close five minutes early, if that's okay? Okay, well, you got five more minutes in your life today. <laughs> Maybe you get a snack or something. <laughs> all That's right. all. Thank you.